Well, I don't know. Kendra's still peeing. But we should go anyway, shouldn't we? Yeah. My name is Steve Hayes. I'm from, so I asked why, why University of Nevada, not comma Reno? It's just a goose UNLV. We're the University of Nevada. Uh, <clears throat> what I want to talk about uh, is uh, the future of behavior analysis, or at least the contextualistic wing of it, and make the argument that it belongs inside evolution science. Um, <clears throat> They've always been linked. We'd, I just went. Is that okay? Did you have to? People stopped talking and they looked at me funny. Um, they've always been kind of obviously linked in terms of some general properties, monistic, naturalistic, functional, contextual, I would argue. They both appeal to variation and selective retention in one form uh, or another. And behavior analysis, at least the founder of behavior analysis, um, argued that they were linked repeatedly in places like these quotes, arguing that uh, selection by consequences is a causal mode that was first recognized in natural selection, but also accounts for the shaping and maintenance of behavior. And you need to deal with both phylogeny and autogeny to understand and have a full account. And there's kind of an obvious parallel if you just read Darwin it has the same feel, it has a grand, grand scope, it has the same sort of meta-theoretical posture. This is from his famous last paragraph talking essentially about variation and selection as the way that we're gonna think about uh, the development of species. But despite that overlap, the, the alliance never really happened. Part of it was anti-behavioral nonsense. And now that I'm hanging around evolutionists a, a lot, I've heard more about blank slates and black boxes that I've ever heard in my whole freaking life. And within their little community, boy, they are really clear what behavioral psychology is. And if you don't recognize those terms, uh, well, they do. And they think they're really telling. Uh, part of it was poor communication. If you want to see something sad, listen to the tapes of E.O. Wilson and B.F. Skinner trying to talk to each other and talking right past each other. I think Fred's as much default at fault as uh, Ed, and maybe even more so. Part of it, I think, was a conceptual deficit. And behavioral psychology, very uh, soon after the possibilities opened up, took a pretty difficult fall from which we haven't fully recovered. And it was uh, ironically around this same issue. It was around the issue of evolution science. Now, this isn't the, f the cause of the fall, but I like uh, quoting Marty Seligman's uh, On Generality of the Laws of Learning article in 1970 because it so clearly crystallized what happened when behavioral psychology was pushed off the table in the name of evolution science. That uh, article uh, argued that there were two big reasons to, to uh, question uh, where uh, learning theory and learning in general was going. One was the anomalies that you could point to that didn't seem to fit operator classical accounts, taste aversion being the most uh, dominant uh, example. If you irradiate an animal, make it sick, uh, it will avoid uh, the unique ta ta uh, tastes that have been exposed to over perhaps up to 24 hours, even longer in some preparations. A lot of this evolved over time in terms of what the details were. And uh, I don't want to get ahead of my story, but it was enough to uh, kind of have people go, man, that doesn't look anything like classical conditioning. It's not a matter of seconds, it's a matter of multiple hours. And the other, of course, is language. Uh, this is just a quote from uh, Marty's uh, article, instrumental and class. By the way, they refuse to call it opera. And I've noticed the evolutionists won't call it opera. There's language association. Uh, anyway, instrumental and classical conditioning is not adequate for an analysis of language was the conclusion. And then the big uh, conclusion, which is in Seligman, but I think was determined by the field, which was basically that the laws of learning discovered with love repressing and salivation may not hold. Pulling down what I never think was never a central tendency of behavioral thinking, that there's equal associability or something. I mean, you can find lots of cases where behavioral analysts uh, uh, warned against that specifically. They knew full well uh, that uh, they were dealing with a uh, 
uh, a re response that was not entirely arbitrary, etc. It was not a blank slate. But nevertheless, that was a cartoon, and it, believe me, it stuck. Uh, we, I think we know that, but when you get outside of our little ghetto, you really find out how much it stuck. The cognitivists concluded something even a little more aggressive, although uh, Marty kind of invited him to go there, which is that all of the results, this is from Brewer's classic uh, uh, chapter uh, in one of the early kind of cognitive revolution volumes, all of the results of traditional conditioning literature do the operation of higher mental processes. In other words, everything that Peyranus had done was worthless. It was just a funny little corner, didn't apply generally, and by the way, it was all accounted for by cognitive processes. And then the, in a more modern time, evolutionary psychology sort of doubles down on that, rebelling not just against behavioral folks, but the cognitive folks as well, and saying that there are no general processes at all. It's all massive modularity. We're more like uh, uh, studying the engineering of a big jumbo jet than we are the laws of physics. <coughs> uh, now, over the years, behavior analysts have picked up on these issues, and they needed to, but I think we've done enough that it's time to push ahead and redo the alliance with evolution science. And uh, we're actively involved doing that, uh, doing that. I'm spending a lot of my time hanging out with and writing articles with major evolutionary people, and it turns out they're actually receptive to behavioral people for some reasons that I will try to explain in terms of what's happened in evolution science itself. Uh, First, the anomalies. One thing, this is kind of an aside, but I think it's, it would be helpful to be a little more clear about what learning is and what learning isn't. I'll have a little kind of offshoot of that. And, and also, uh, with regard to the anomalies, I think we then have to study how general learning processes are adjusted by other evolutionary processes based on uh, the history of the organisms and actions involved in their particular ecological niches. And I do think we have to do something with regard to language. You wouldn't be surprised to hear me say that. Uh, I think we have to abandon interpretation as a primary mode. If it's not experimental, I just don't even want to hear it anymore. And I think we can revisit the view, that, that whole point of view from an evolutionary, sensible, contextual behavioral approach. Again, adjusting learning processes by other evolutionary processes based on the history of the organisms and the actions involved. And that would put us in the position, I think we are there, if we're willing to take advantage of it. We are, as a wing of it, we're taking advantage of it. But I think it's more generally applicable to create a new form of evolutionary psychology based on contextual behavioral foundations and a view of evolution science that comports with them. Uh, so that's really the focus of my talk, and those three last slides are basically the, the outline of the talk. Uh, first, a little, a little aside on learning. We're not very good sometimes, I think, at being really clear about what learning is. You find definitions like the effective experience on behavior, which just does not work very well. It's too broad in some ways, too narrow in others. And cognitivists in particular are kind of, and not just them, the evolutionists point to uh, problems there, like latent learning. You can be exposed to things at time one and not see something until time two uh, in the world of behavior, and yet you know that something happened at time one. For those of us who don't require uh, you know, things to be connected together in a mechanistic sense. Time is not the problem, it is for others, but there are wings of behavioral psychology for whom that's a problem. And they go to ABBA and they hang out and they really want, if it's not together in time, it doesn't, it's not linked. Um, uh, also, not all effects of experience on behavior seem to fit the, com the concept of learning. Startle responses, for example, um, fatigue, there's others. And not all changes in behavior are due to experience, of course. Uh, there's no reason why part of our phenotype can't be behavioral and be due to genetic variation. Skinner said that clearly, and so that's also part of our tradition. Now, cognitivists have reacted to that, as you know, by coming to the conclusion that changes in behavior are neither necessary nor sufficient for learning. And so what they do is they basically put it inside the organism. They say we're studying changes in the organism. Um, and then those changes in the organism mediate the uh, effects of experience on behavior. That puts them in a terrible bind, however, which, uh, because they don't have any way of measuring the changes in the organism specifically. 
And even the neurobiological kind of images and so forth that aren't really truly satisfying for them and not specific enough, they have to throw out a whole lot of specificity about functional classes of learning because if it's hard enough to get any kind of general sense of learning and where they, where they end up is defaulting to measuring behavior, which they just said you couldn't do to measure learning, uh, it's even worse when you get to things like operant and classical conditioning. You need more specific changes. For example, you have to put the associations in the mind, brain, or memory of the organism, which is what they do. They say it's stimulus, stimulus, associations, not relationships. Uh, but then they don't have any way of measuring those directly in the organism. They can only measure them by behavior. There's an evolutionary sensible solution. This is drawn from uh, Jan de Hauer, uh, uh, Dermot Barnes Holmes, and uh, uh, Agnes uh, Moore's uh, uh, upcoming article in Psychonomic Bulletin that I really like, which defines this learning this way. And by the way, Jan is a major cognitive scientist who's gradually being pulled in a functional direction by RFT and Dermot and uh, wrote a very nice, well, was a special issue of, uh, I think it was uh, Current Directions in Psychological Science, that if you want to feel good about where behavioral stuff fits, read that, that orienting uh, article article by Jan, uh, because it's all about how cognitivists, whoops, by the way, need functional behavioral accounts. Um, anyway, they define learning as changes in the behavior of an organism that are a result of regularities in the environment of that organism. It's an elegant solution.